Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast, part of the 90 Min Football Network. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simu, and I'm delighted to be joined in the studio once again by my good friend, footballer, broadcaster, uh, Jamal Fifield. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Can't complain. How are you? Good, good. Arsenal top of the league. What's there to complain about? <laughs> Very true. Very true. Especially after those tweets we were sending each other. It's just... Uh... It's a great time for the club, isn't it? It is. It really is. The, the feel-good factor is back. The mood is great. Yeah. The results are great. The performances are great. It's a really good time. And I think the last few years and, and sort of the struggles that we've had have kind of taught us to enjoy these moments when they come along. Definitely. Definitely. And I still think there's a bit of um, apprehension in terms of where we think we can go. Um, but I think it's slowly building um, for the potential of this of this young squad. Because they are still a young squad. And... Um, you can just see the confidence growing every single week, you know, um, and that's credit to the manager and the things that he's implementing on the training field. That's a really good place to start. Where do you think that this team can go? Because I've, I've been very clear on this show over the past few weeks, you know, that to me, challenging for the title still feels beyond us. Mm -hmm. It still feels like there's a couple of areas in that team, a couple of areas in that squad that if we were to lose players, I feel like the damage would be too much for us to sustain this current level. Yeah. So looking at it now, where do you see Arsenal ending up? What do you think is a realistic a, a objective? Should we still be pursuing a top four position or, or has the time come to maybe raise the bar a little bit? I think it'd be interesting to um, hear what Arteta thinks, sorry, thought about where what we could do this year. Mm. Um, I don't think that should change, in my opinion. I think top four was the aim and I still think top four should be the aim. It comes down to now, okay, how do we get to that? And how do we do that on a consistent basis? I personally think that at the moment it's maybe a bit too far to be challenging, but at the same time we beat a team in Liverpool that have dominated us and the league for a long time in, in recent times, you know. So it would be interesting to see what they, um, those guys think, but I think we should still aim for just that top four spot and then think after that's a bonus, you know. You know how strong Man City are. Yeah. Chelsea always going to be up there. Um, and even Manchester United are trying to have a little bit of a resurgence. So. It'll be interesting. And obviously we've got the nosy neighbours down at Tottenham <laughs> trying, trying their thing. So I think personally top four, I don't think we're ready for the league yet. But again, the way we're playing doesn't seem like we fear anyone. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how we do. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not at the point yet where my mindset has shifted. I still feel like what we're doing right now is, is not proving that we're title contenders. It's we're giving ourselves a greater chance of achieving what we actually set out to which I'd imagine was to finish in the top four, get back in the Champions League. And it's all confidence building as well, you know. The the two results we've had, the two um, league results we've had, it's been amazing. And that was maybe a question mark of ours. OK, so we beat a couple of teams in, in the early parts of the season that, to be honest, we probably should have beaten because we are still Arsenal. Um, but those, these last two results have really made us feel, fill us with hope in a way that, okay, we can compete and we are doing it convincingly at the same time. You know, there's still a few things that we could brush up on, but I'm seeing little things that I haven't seen before. So for instance, um, Jota was breaking down, I think the left-hand side and Odegaard took him out and took a yellow for the team. Like those are the little things that win you football matches. Um, and, and we've had that attitude where in, in recent times it might've been a bit lightweight um, and wet behind the ears, but in this young team, there's a lot of experience. And I thought that really showed um, where, how far we've come. And we really rode out difficult moments, didn't we, against Liverpool and against Spurs at times as well. I thought sort of after they equalised, just before they equalised, they were, I'm not going to go as far as saying they were massively on top. I think a lot has been made of that. And actually, when I watched the game back calmly later on, I yeah. didn't feel the same as I felt during it. I didn't feel that anxiety. Um, but we've shown that we can get through those moments and we've shown that we can come out the other side and then get back to playing our game. Yeah, you do. You need luck. You need luck. There's, there's never going to be time where for the full night it makes you dominating. Mm. You know, um, we spoke off camera about how we're starting games. We're taking, we're taking teams by surprise. I mean, it's always, as a player myself, we always say start the game well and grow into it at the same time. And we're doing that. You see, Arteta has got those boys running from the minute go and that's why we scored so early. But again, it's, it's, it's hard to maybe put into words how you should stay in games and how you're riding out of luck. But we do need that luck and we are getting it. For instance, in another in another week, we might have got a penalty from Gabriel. They might, Gabriel might have given away a penalty. Yeah. But on this occasion... So a, as a centre-back yourself, yeah. 
would if if that was given against you, what would have your reaction been? Obviously, you, you don't want a decision given yeah. against you, but would you have understood the decision had the referee pointed to the spot there? On the um, current rules and guidelines, I would have understood it. But at the same time, the ball came off his chest first. Mm. If you watch closely, the ball comes off his chest. I am a little bit worried about Gabriel in terms of his endeavour is never in question. I just think sometimes he's, he gave away a penalty, obviously, at, um, against Liverpool, was it? Um, and he nearly gave one one there. Against Spurs, he yeah. gave, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's one of those um, games where, sorry, as a defender, you have to be touch tight you have to you have to put in tackles you be out you also have to be smart in the way you defend and i'm not saying he's not a smart defender it's just sometimes he's a bit overzealous and i think in in more games to come people might use that against him because they know he's going to put in the challenge you know he's going to be may have one or two laps in concentration but in all fairness to him he's all or nothing and that's what i love about the way he defends like he really puts his body on the line for the team and there's times when he gets us out of so many difficult situations that um it's 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 a pleasure to watch when defenders are like that. You know, he's like a real throwback. He wants to defend. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I would have felt hard done by if, if that penny was given against me. You kind of need that balance though, don't you, at centre-back? You need the aggressor and you need one who's a little bit more composed, drops off a couple of extra yards, reads the game. And I think in Saliba and Gabriel, we kind of got that now. We do. But if you had two Salibas or two Gabriels, then that balance is affected, is it not? I, I think so, yeah. I think if you look at all the um, great partnerships over the years, you know, you've got the Vidic and Rio or John Terry and Carvalho, you know, those are the, the defenders that had a partnership where one was the aggressor and one was the calm, cool, calm and collected um, player. But I think it's, um, I think what's, what's really benefited Arsenal at the moment is um, the continuity through the team. You know, he's kept a consistent 11 that all understands what each other, how each other plays. Um, and, and we talk about sleep all the time, but he's really come into his own. Um, and, a, and a word for Tomiyasu, who kept Mo Salah quiet, which is obviously difficult being one of the best players in the world. So all through that back line, it's just that they're so dedicated to the defence right now. Um, it's a pleasure to watch. What's it like, like obviously playing as a centre-back, you, you will have, I'm sure, played under different managers who had different ways of seeing the game. Yeah. So some will have probably wanted you to play a higher line. Some would have wanted you to maybe sit deeper on the edge of your penalty area. Yeah. As a centre-back, am I right in saying that it's more comfortable for you when you are playing that bit deeper? Because you're not worrying about the space in behind, just the space in front of you. Whereas what Arsenal are asking Saliba and Gabriel to do is to be part of the press, is to step into the midfield and close those spaces down and help out, but also to marshal an awful lot of room in behind. Yeah, um, and that, that's where Ramsdale comes in as well, because he's got a give the bat line the assurance that if it does go over the head, he's there to clean it up. Um, but again, I think good managers play to the style that the players that they have. So you're not going to play, if you've got a slow back four, you're not going to play a high line because you know if the ball goes over the top, you're not going to be able to recover. But I think in Ben White, in Saliba, um, Tommy Yassi, whether it's Inchenko or Tini, we're all quick enough to get back. Um, I prefer to play more, more of a, a mid block where we're halfway between the penalty area and the halfway line. Um, but the high, the high line that Arsenal are playing at the moment, it can be sometimes a bit scary, but I think they're doing it really well because under, everyone understands why they're doing it. So it gives the midfield a chance to get close to the opposition. So if, if the game was more stretched, people be able to pick around us and play, play through us. But I think the way he set them up, um, Arteta, is, is, is proving that we can get the ball back a lot quicker and a lot higher and get their goal a lot quicker as well. Um, but I'd say it's definitely working. And also the, the other thing as well is like when you hear a manager putting across an idea that maybe you're not 100% sure about as he's kind of putting it across mm. to then reap the rewards of that, see the benefits of that. It, it builds faith and confidence in the manager's methods, doesn't it? So you look at that team now and you probably think, well, every one of these guys understands the benefits of what we're doing and why we're doing it and hence why everybody's on the same page. Definitely. And, you know, when you make plans and you put a team out, with a different style of play and it doesn't go right, that's when the question marks start coming. And as a player, I've, I've questioned managers, okay, this isn't working, we need to change. And some managers stick to it, regardless if it's working or not. Um, but the fact that we are getting success now, everyone's buying into it. You can see that. When we score a goal, everyone's around each other. Jacques is in there, Jean and everyone up, getting everyone going and, and mm. focus on the task to come again. But I think it is so important that we are having that success because now it just builds confidence for the next couple of weeks going into the next um, set of games, you know. So. Um, 
it's, it's about understanding what we have to do as a team to be to become successful um, and I think that's what we're doing yeah totally agree totally agree um, really really enjoying it at the moment uh, of course uh, but we got to speak about Gabriel Martinelli mm -hmm. um, we did a show uh, just recently where we were talking about his contract situation he's revealed basically that those talks are ongoing mm -hmm. still a couple of years left on his remaining contract I think Arsenal have an option to extend it a further year but it's time now that Arsenal give him a contract that reflects his role in the squad is it not I, I, I believe so listen when you want you want big game players and for him to perform how he did at his young age because he's still relatively new to the Premier League let's be honest um, but he's such an important part of this team and he had his injury worries and he's come back this season like a new player. He seems a lot more confident. He seems a lot more tactically aware. Um, and technically, there's no dispute in his quality. You know, when he's one-on-one -on -one with a player, he just gets past him nine times out of 10. Um, so I totally agree. And I think Arsenal realised the player that they have on their hands. Um, hats off to the recruitment, because to unearth a gem like that, it's not Six easy. million pounds. That's a steal. Six million pounds. That's a steal. If, no. we, if, we're, if, if we were to sell him, he'd probably command well over 50 mil, 60 mil, because, simply because of his age and how well he's doing. Um, but no, I think he definitely deserves a new deal, regardless of how, how long he's got. You see Chelsea giving players eight-year contracts. If he signs one of them, get, get it signed <laughs> up, you know? Um, but no, I have heard that they're quite a while, a way away from coming to an agreement. But you want to be places where you're going to play and where you, where you think you can win and progress. And I think this is the best place for him if he, if he has a sit down and really thinks about it. It's so key that the club managed to maintain the levels that these players aspire to, to get achieving because in the past we've been burnt by that, right? People like Robin Van Persie have turned around and gone, that one hurt. Well, you know, I love this club, but you know, I want to win one, a Premier that League. One and hurt. That one hurt. Yeah, it did, it yeah. did. But I think, and at the time I was one of those people that was like, I can't believe he's joined Man United. He's a disgrace, he's this and that. But as the dust settled over the years and I look back on it, and I think, well, the club weren't going in the right direction. You voiced those concerns. It wasn't addressed. And, you know, people pin that on Arsene Wenger. I think that was largely due to the club's hierarchy yeah. at the time. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it's just one of those unfortunate situations. But now we're growing with these boys, with Saka, with Martinelli. Even people like Martin Odegaard, like you forget how young these people are. Even Tommy Asu, like yeah. these guys are young men still, Saliba. But what you have to do is, is grow at the same rate as them. Matching the ambitions of a player mm. is it's, it's hugely important. Um, and, and sometimes that's more, than, that's more important than money. Because let's be honest, these guys aren't struggling financially. What they want to do is win and progress. Now, if we have a top four finish, we're able to um, look at better players. We're more of a, in a healthy position to attract better players. So players can see the players coming in. And although it's competition, they're also going to think, OK, this player is going to help us become even better and get closer to our ultimate goal of winning the Premier League. So I think it's so important that we continue on this form because other players around the, um, around the world are noticing, OK, Arsenal are not up. I see how they're playing. I want to be a part of that. But that only comes if we're going to win. But again, the players that are at, are at the club currently, they can see the direction we're going at because they're in, in the club every, um, around the club every day. So it's so important that we carry on how we are because that will go so well to attracting more players and, and keeping the ones that we've already got. You was uh, doing co-commentary on BBC Radio London yeah. for the North London derby. Um, saw you briefly before the game. We didn't get a chance to catch up after, but yeah. kind of how was that? Because I find when I'm doing my own team, yeah. it can be quite tough to keep your emotions in check like I've I listened back to sort of the highlights of of the Liverpool game at the weekend and somebody said to me a friend of mine that I, sh I showed it to said to me you were much sort of higher up in terms of your level when Arsenal scored than when Liverpool scored but that is not just down to your allegiance that's because you're in the home stadium yeah. right so that takes you up a level when they score in a way that the away team yeah. scoring just doesn't yeah but i still find it difficult how did you it's, find it it's so hard it's so hard and on and driving to the stadium i was like okay be impartial don't favor one team as soon as i got there the first thing i said yeah we arsenal i said oh my god <laughs> so i had to write down don't say we say arsenal because it was just a natural thing to say for me um and but i, I think i think i handled it well in the end once i got around <laughs> probably in the second half but um no it was, it was an amazing game where you could really see how the things we're doing on the training pitch is coming out on a saturday on a match day um unbelievable game to be involved in um 
and and it was like an honor for me to be able to commentate on that game and give my view of it to the listeners you know um and and what we're actually doing on the pitch it's it's quite a drastic change from last season you know so it's 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 something that can only be down to the players really putting the time and effort in to understand the system, understand what it takes to be playing at that level they are. Because the way we're, even the way we're pressing, you can't do that without a certain level of fitness. Yeah. Um, so there's so many different levels to it. And we're just firing the four cylinders at the moment. So here's a question. Because look, as much as we can sit here and, and wax lyrical about Gabriel Martinelli, and, and you know, he has been great. He ultimately got his chance back in the side because Emil Smith-Rowe was out injured. Now, he started last season like a house on fire, playing from that left-hand side, drifting in, scoring goals regularly, yeah. and then obviously he's had his injury problems. And that's opened the door for Martinelli, who has taken the chance with both hands and has mm. been incredible. But I am under no illusions that Emil Smith-Rowe is a player that Mikel Arteta really likes. And maybe when he comes back to fitness, Mikel will have a decision to make on that left side because... I don't think he views Smith Rowe as a central player as mm -hmm. the, the way some of us as fans do. Yeah. But would we be as aggressive in the press? Couldn't this style of play work the same with a Smith Rowe instead of a Martinelli who might be a little bit more calculated, a little bit more, um, you know, a little bit stronger in terms of his vision, yeah. but doesn't have that explosion of pace and that aggression do you think that, that if that was to happen and Emil uh, Smith-Rowe was to come in, that changes a bit? I think so, simply because every player that's came into the side for the Europa League have done it exactly the same way. You know, um, Emmanuel Smith-Rowe is an intelligent player. So, OK, what he lacks in speed against Martinelli, he makes up for in his positioning. Um, I don't think it would be an issue at all. And... Yes, Arteta will have a decision in his hands, but that's what he's paid for. That's yeah. what, that's the manager. There's only eleven. It's a good place to be in. <laughs> literally, like it's it's one of those things where you've got eleven places to pick, and your 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 it's your job to make those hard decisions. You know, um, and Kay, every time he plays, he scores. But the way um, Jesus is playing, he's undroppable at the moment. So everybody who comes in is knocking at the door. Every I think every single player in that squad can knock on Arteta's door and say, "Why aren't I playing?" Well, the team's playing really well. You just have to keep going. And when you get your chance, like Martinelli has done, take it with both hands. Um, but I don't think there'll be any issue, especially because when you're winning, it's so much easier. As a player, I know. When you're winning, you do anything. When you're losing is when you, when you might get a, a bit of blowback or resistance from players to maybe play the way you want to play. But when you're winning, everything's going well. You just want to be a part of it. You don't want to be a hindrance. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, one of the great things about the forward line that we have today is that it, it tends to commit people whether it's Martinelli, Saka or Jesus, all of them have the ability to commit defenders, yeah. suck them in yeah. and then have that guile, that pace, that power to get away yeah. from those players. As a defender, what's that like to come up against? It, I mean, imagine now, imagine you were playing centre-back yeah. and Gabriel Martinelli's running at you. What, what goes so through your is, mind? This is a question I asked myself when I was watching the game um, on Sunday. I was like, OK, if I was playing against these three, who would I, which one would I pick? And I don't want to pick any any of them because they're all they all got different attributes, but they're also skillful in the fact that they can stand you up, pop a one two around you, or go one v one against you and go past you. And the the, the quickness of their feet and their brains at the same time, it's unreal. Um, but they also got an understanding of what each other want, where each other wants the ball. So the assists that they're getting across the three of them, the goals that they're all scoring, because they're all scoring goals at different times, you know? Jesus didn't score, but you saw what he did in the game before. You yeah. saw what he did in that game. He's just, there's no selfishness between any of them, you know? And I think sometimes you see a little bit of friction between world-class players, top-class players, where they may not want to, not so much pass to each other, but you saw it when Mane and Salah, Firmino, there was a bit of indecision about, and unsure if it, and they really wanted each other to score or, for instance, a little bit of tension between Mbappe, Neymar and Messi. But with those three, it's like they all want each other to do well. Um, and that's a joy to see because they know, OK, if I put one on the plate for you, you're probably going to put one on the plate for me. Um, so I, won't like, I, can't, I can't pick which one I'd like to play against. <laughs> I'm, not to, I'm not trying to be embarrassed by any of them, to be honest. <laughs> um, talking about strikers that are no longer at the club, there was a leaked video, I don't know if you saw it yesterday. Yeah. Uh, of Aubameyang talking about Mikel Arteta. Yeah. I mean, I've talked about this on, on the show yesterday and, and the thing I felt initially was, okay, it's wrong what Aubameyang is saying, 
but it's a private conversation and it shouldn't have been filmed and leaked. Well, I saw, I saw that he came out um, and spoke about it. Um, and I think he said that tensions, he just left at that time and emotions were high. Mm. Um, but at the same time, the cam I think you would have saw a camera rolling in, in the background. Um, and a player of his, he's, he's a high profile player. So he should be aware of, there's always a chance that this could come out. Um, but at the same time, he spoke, he spoke what he felt. And I, I don't think that should be condemned, you know? He, mm. he has an opinion. And there's nothing wrong with having an opinion. That might actually be what he thinks and feels. Um, and he might be right. It doesn't really matter. Um, I, don't, I don't think, I saw the uproar and I saw everyone tweeting saying that he sour grapes and he's bitter, but that's how football is. And it might even be true, but at the end of the day, he's doing well and Arsenal are doing well. So it shouldn't really matter, you know, but I think that's what makes sports so great. There's so many personalities, so many um, egos, um, and that's what makes football what it is. I, 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 welcome, I welcome that because he's, he's speaking from the heart and sometimes we get these robotic answers from players. Are you, how, how was the game? So, oh, yeah, I'm glad I scored a goal, but it's just more about the team. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, um, you're not. You're fucking delighted that you exactly, scored, mate. Exactly. Like, so <laughs> I feel like we should embrace that. I know that that's, that's like in American sports where a lot more open with the media and they tell people how they feel. But that, I think that's because they've got a better relationship with the media in that they don't feel that the media are just there to get them. And I think in this country, I mean, you've seen it, you know, we both cover football matches, you, you play in them yeah. as well. We've both seen it where like you go to speak to a manager and there is like this media officer um, who is literally like, don't ask this, don't just ask that. don't ask this, yeah. don't ask that, stands in front of them, doesn't let you get a word in edgeways. I had one, I'm not going to say who it was recently, Premier League manager um, who had an issue with me recording what he was saying and even though it was going to go out on the air yeah and basically there was so there was two colleagues there was uh, there was another guy from and there was basically two main stations and i was working for a local station mm -hmm. and the guy uh, basically said no you can't record it those two can record it and then they can send it to you but i need to get it back to the studio quickly so you're going to make me wait I'm standing the distance that you and I Who are did now. You upset, H? Why, so, why, why, why did you it, like this? It's just a media officer, like, <laughs> and, and I've heard from other people that this guy's notoriously like that. Yeah. But, like, the distance was between me and the Premier League manager the way me and you so are it now. Made no difference so, it would have made no difference if my phone was there recording as well as the other two. Yeah. And it's like, why are you creating this tension before we've even asked any questions? That's why there's that friction yeah. between the media between players, between managers. It just makes no sense to me. But yeah, I mean, you're right to say that people should be allowed to have their opinions. I, I don't have a problem with that. I disagree with what Aubameyang said, but again, I go back to my original point. The, the worst thing for me is that if he didn't know that this was being recorded, that someone would do that. Like, what have they gained out of it? Like, yeah. You know, nobody's talking about who it was that posted it. No, of course, of course. Um, but again, that's why you've got to be careful about who you surround yourself with. Mm especially as a high profile player, even players at my level, you just got to be careful what you say and who you say it to. But listen, it, I don't, I didn't think it was that bad if I'm, if I'm totally honest. It's not like he was like, he's an F in this and he's exactly. an F. Exactly. He just said, you know, he's got a problem dealing with big players. Yeah. And that was it. But again, listen, Arteta was an amazing player and it, he was, he was new to management. So it may be, it might, it may be an adjustment dealing with a certain personality. Um, but that's not really a slight. That's just him trying to find ways to manage his team best. And at the end of the day, the team's the most important. So if you have got a player of immense ability, but maybe you feel he's a disruption and a hindrance to what you're trying to do, then you have to get him out, you know? What I would say about Arteta is I think there's been a clear development in his management style. Like, I felt like when he first started the job, he was very open spoke about everything like when he took over all the things that needed to change at the club and then there was a couple of moments i'll always remember the game away to leeds i think it was the season before last when nicolas pepe got sent off and he basically came out and threw him under a bus after the game and from then on i've never seen him do that yeah. when someone's made a mistake like i think he's learned his lessons along the way and i think that people just need to remember that as much as we're talking about this team being young and developing and needing opportunity so is the manager yeah and that's the thing i think as a manager, you've always got to be wary of what you say because not only is the media and the fans going to listen, your players are also going to listen. So mm. 
and that can be a breakdown of trust because they see their teammate get in front of us, they're going to think, okay, well, that can be me, you know? Um, but again, sometimes when new managers come into a club, I've had this numerous times where they feel as though they have to put their foot down to show that they're not to be messed with and that can go even one way or another. Sometimes it works, but sometimes it really doesn't. Um, and I'm not saying that's what Arteta did, but at the end of the day, he needed to go in there and make changes. He's felt changes need to be, needed to be made um, and he done them. And at the end of the day, right now, you can't really argue with his methods because he's getting the results. Yeah, that's it. But it hasn't always been getting the results and that's why, would you say, all the criticism was coming? Definitely. You know, when, when things are not going well, you're the worst. When, when you're winning games, you beat Liverpool, you beat Tottenham, you're the best manager in the world. Probably we're manager of the month, but it's only, it's not, you're only a few results away from being in the position of, say, Brendan Rodgers, who's another great manager, but he's getting so much flat right now. So that's the, that's the nature of the game. You know, it's, it's a results-based business. You're not doing a the business then question marks start coming. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, that brings us to the end uh, of this episode. Great chat about the mighty Arsenal, as always, with the brilliant at Jamal Firefield. Make sure you follow him on the socials. How can people follow you? Um, Instagram and Twitter, Jamal Firefield. There you go. Uh, we're going to be jumping over to the Chronicles of Aguna Premium in just a minute. We're going to be uh, doing a bit of a deep dive on the Arsenal defence. So if you haven't signed up, make sure you do and you can join us for that in a bit. Cheers. <laughs> 